All right. Well, welcome everybody um, to our March 1st Saturday seminar. Um, we have a excellent group of speakers that we'll be sharing today about our um, Stop, Check, and Enjoy campaign. Um, so my name, if you don't know me already, is Marissa Blackburn, and I'm the Environmental Education Manager at the Your River Watch. Um, and I'm just going to give a few quick updates if you're not already um, liking our social media pages and part of our um, e-newsletter, feel free to subscribe to that and get all of our Cape Fear River Watch updates. Um, and then also next week, next Saturday, we have our, um, our cleanup. So we have our uh, green up cleanup happening as our monthly cleanup. Um, and that's gonna be taking place at Dreams of Wilmington in downtown. So feel free to join us for that if you're around and interested. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on over to our inter to um, Kiara Klein, who's going to be introducing our speakers today. Um, Kiara is the uh, program coordinator for community engagement with Duke University Superfund Research Center. So Kiara, take it away. Sure, hi everyone. Uh, good morning, happy Saturday. Uh, glad you're all joining us. Um, Moshkan, if you wanna go ahead and share our PowerPoint, uh, I will get started with um, doing some introductions of our speakers this morning. Um, but again, as Marissa said, I am the program coordinator with the Community Engagement Corps of the Duke University Superfund Research Center. Um, so essentially what that means is I try to get all of the awesome research being done by the center out into the world, into communities. Um, and uh, we're really honored today to have two of our other team members with us today who are going to talk about some of the really great science that is being done uh, around our fish consumption work. Um, so I'll first introduce Dr. Moshkan Rajai, who is an assistant professor of public health at Oakland University in Michigan. We're really honored to have her on our team. Um, her research focuses on environmental health and justice issues. As well, we have Dr. Abby Joyce, who's a research scientist at Duke University, uh, where she manages the analytical chemistry core for Duke Superfund Research Center. Uh, her research focuses on measuring and understanding environmental contaminants, especially PFAS. She's a bit of a PFAS expert. Um, and again, I am with the Duke University Superfund Research Center as well. Um, so talking about our uh, presentation today and kind of the background of our work, we're calling this Behind the Stop, Check, and Enjoy campaign, Toxic Chemicals in Cape Fear River Fish. So some of y'all hopefully are already familiar uh, with this campaign or with the work that we do. Um, but I'll go into a little bit of the background of this project, which started back in 2016. And then I'm sure uh, the venerable Veronica Carter will be able to tell us a little bit more about uh, the background itself. Um, but this project uh, was kind of came out of this recognition that there were folks that were fishing out of the Cape Fear River um, and that they were doing so out of need or out of some need to feed themselves or their families. Um, so we kind of got that information from running a series of surveys. The first was a household survey. Um, and then the second, a few years later was a bank side survey. Um, but based on these two surveys, 44% um, of families in low income neighborhoods uh, were fishing out of the river and eating the fish that they were catching. So that was from the household survey. And we got similar results in running the bank side survey. 59% uh, of those fishers were eating the fish that they were catching from the Cape Fear River. Um, and we wanted to kind of make that distinction and make that really clear because this is different from just recreational fishing. This is people um, choosing to eat the fish that they are catching because uh, they want to be able to feed themselves or their families. So that was kind of the genesis of the project. If you wanna to go to the next slide. <laughs> um, and so similarly, uh, we were we had this understanding that not only were folks catching and eating this fish themselves, so the fisher people um, in particular, but they were also sharing it with others. Um, and in the environmental contaminant toxicology world, that means often we know that that means that um, they're they were probably sharing with folks that were from what we consider to be vulnerable populations. Um, so women who are or may become pregnant, uh, children under fifteen. Um, so we were recognizing that uh, the effects of these contaminants were going beyond likely the people who are actually catching the fish themselves. If you want to move forward a bit. 
we were also cognizant of the fact that people were eating a decent amount of fish that they were catching out of the river, one to three fish meals per month. Um, and at each of these meals, most folks were eating one to two portions of fish. That's important uh, because if we go to the next slide, we'll see what is um, part of a fish consumption advisory. Um, now, these fish consumption advisories are put out by NCDHHS, um, and they're based around the best existing understanding of what folks are eating and the fish in the river. Um, best known understanding means that uh, the science is, is updated as often as possible, um, but that there are populations and species that are missed. Um, but maybe some of you have seen a fish consumption advisory like this one. Maybe you haven't. Um, they aren't posted super prolifically, um, and they're a little bit hard to detect when they are posted. They're sometimes posted in conjunction with a lot of other stuff. Uh, if any of you have been to a boat ramp, which I'm sure you have there, tons of other kind of flyers and posters up. Um, but this is pretty much what a basic fish consumption advisory looks like. Um, they do contain the species of fish that we're talking about. Um, they contain the location or the body of water that is being talked about. Um, so in this case, we're talking about striped bass. You can see that photo. Um, we are talking about striped bass in the Cape Fear River. Um, they talk about contaminant levels and the type of contaminate, contaminant levels. So in this case, PCBs. Um, and then they do give some meal limit and meal portion recommendations. So if you see down at the bottom, do not eat more than two meals of fish per week from this lake, and then they specify what one meal is considered, which is six ounces of uncooked fish. Um, this particular advisory does have a translation in Spanish, which is great. Um, and then sometimes they will talk a little bit more about the population that these fish consumption advisories are targeted to. Um, so this is kind of what was existing for folks to know uh, what fish they were eating and whether they were contaminated prior to the work that the Superfund Research Center has done. So just to give sort of an overview of the existing consumption advisories before they were updated recently, they were updated back in October. So on the left of this chart here, um, you'll see in yellow are the fish that are most commonly consumed by folks eating out of the Cape Fear River. Again, this information was uh, derived pretty much from those two surveys, the household survey and the bank side survey. So we had folks self-reporting what they were eating, uh, which can be a little tricky sometimes. Sometimes there are different names for uh, fish that people use. Sometimes there's not necessarily an awareness or a knowledge of what folks are catching. Um, but essentially these kind of larger fish species like catfish, striped bass, largemouth bass, the red and black drum and speckled trout were the most commonly caught species. And maybe if some of y'all are fishers, that might sound about right. Um, these are the three contaminants that, or types of contaminants that advisories existed for, mercury and arsenic, which folks are relatively familiar with. Those are um, some high profile heavy metal contaminants. And then hexavalent chromium, which folks might be a little less familiar with. And then the X's or uh, the kind of colored squares indicate um, partially uh, where the contaminants existed or where the uh, consumption advisories existed for, and then uh, which fish actually had those consumption advisories. So you can take a look at that. Uh, most, most of the consumption advisories that existed were for mercury, um, and they're pretty wide. I know y'all are more familiar with this area than I am. Pretty wide swaths of area, um, pretty big chunks of area there. So moving forward, um, we kind of wanted to take that initial research question um, of people knowing that people were eating fish out of the river and eating, doing so out of need and sharing it with others. And what we kind of wanted to expand on um, is how, how contaminated are these fish? Um, what contaminants exist and in what concentrations? What are the potential health risks of folks eating uh, these fish out of the river, particularly for, for vulnerable populations? And then how can we most effectively reach and communicate to the people who are eating this fish um, to be able to reduce the risks, the health risks? 
So along with the Duke University Superfund Research Center, um, we are extremely grateful to be in collaboration with some incredible organizations um, already doing this work and kind of clean water work in general along the river and environmental justice work along the river. Um, so Cape Fear River Watch uh, itself is a great partner of ours, a long-term partner of ours, along with the NC Coastal Federation, the NAACP of New Hanover County. Uh, we work closely or try to work closely with most of the county uh, public health departments and extension offices as well in the three counties that we work in. Uh, and we also partner with the NC Wildlife Resources Commission and the Department of Marine Fisheries who do kind of more of the biology work around this kind of stuff. And just to give a little bit of a timeline for what we've been doing, where we started and where we are now, um, back in 2016 was the original grant that got us uh, up and running out the door on our feet to be able to do this work. Um, that was back in 2016. Our household survey that I was uh, mentioning earlier was conducted in 2016, 2017. So that was kind of our initial round of data gathering. Uh, we did stage some community focus groups in 2018 to be able to get a better understanding of the folks who were eating fish out of the river. Um, in 2019, we held an NC Fish Forum uh, where we were able to share a lot of this information um, with the public. Some of y'all might have even been at that forum. Um, and our EPA grant ended at that time, uh, which kind of resulted in this Stop, Check, Enjoy social marketing campaign that I will talk a little bit more about later, but that's kind of the crux of the work that we did with that grant. Um, the, the Stop, Check, Enjoy campaign came out of that grant. Uh, the first of two master's projects that came out of Duke University around this subject uh, con were conducted in 2019-2020, um, and they conducted the Bankside survey. They also ran an online survey. And then in 2020-2021, uh, the second master's project uh, kind of took this uh, work and ran with it, uh, and that was myself and uh, Pierre that did this project. We kind of refined all of the Stop, Check, Enjoy materials that existed. Uh, we ran some focus groups, conducted further surveys, so just tried to gather a little bit more information. And then the most recent fish tissue collection and analysis was um, done in 2020, 2021, so pretty recently, um, and that was reviewed by DHHS. And that's, so that's where a lot of the information that we currently have actually came from. So now I will turn it over to Moshgan and Abby, um, and they'll tell you a little bit more about the results from this 2020, 2021 fish tissue analysis. Thank you, Kira. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, we're going to just go over now. Um, Abby and I will talk about the fish tissue analysis, and that's a big chunk of what we want to talk about now is get you guys information about what we found in terms of the toxic chemicals in the fish that we analyzed. So sorry if there's any slides, sometimes it comes off of the PowerPoint. Um, so this is a really busy graph um, graphic, and I'm just going to try to break it down for you first. Um, so this is a process showing uh, uh, the, how kind of what the um, Division of Public Health in North Carolina and the DEQ suggest in terms of if you want to actually set a fish consumption advisory, what do you need to do? And so it starts off here on the left um, and kind of these blue boxes on figuring out what fish do you need to collect. So first you have to collect some fish. You need to get species that are high on the food chain, so high trophic level. And those that are on kind of lower trophic level, either low on the food chain or somewhere in the middle. You want essentially two levels of the trophic level or in the food chain represented. And that's to understand, like for chemicals that biomagnify the food chain, how do we see differences in those chemicals in those different types of fish? So you have to do that um, once you've selected a site, you pick two different species of fish. From there, you have to then um, collect the fish if they're large fish, you can get a fillet and you can use that for your analysis and you just need one fish. If it's a really small fish, that doesn't work as well. So you need a few fish. So you need somewhere between three to seven individual fish and you then create a composite where you literally kind of take parts of the fish and you push, kind of mash them up all together essentially um, and homogenize them is what it's called. So that way you get the chemical kind of spread throughout it. Um, so there's two different types of kind of samples of the fish that we can use. We then get them analyzed by a lab that's approved by the EPA and the Division of Public Health knows how to analyze 
certain chemicals and analyze them properly through proper kind of quality control. And then this is when we move over to the right side. And this is what we're gonna focus a lot on too today is, okay, once we know the level, what, what does that mean? And so the first part is we do a screening um, based on the concentration in a fish. There's a screening level we can look at. And the Division of Public Health in North Carolina uses the same um, screening level that the EPA sets, the USA EPA sets. And so you take that screening level and then you figure out, is the concentration in a fish above or below that level? If it's below that level, no advisory is issued, you're done, this is considered safe. And the screening level is set really low um, in order to kind of just right, trigger a further review. So once, um, you know, if, you, if it's below, you're good. If it's above that screening level, then you have to actually look into it further and figure out, well, how unsafe is this? How high is this concentration? And what does it mean for the recommendation for consumption advisories? And so from there, we can calculate a meal limit. I'm gonna go over this um, a little bit later in the presentation of like, how do we, act, like, what do these actually mean? Because <laughs> um, it's a little bit confusing. So we take a meal, we create these meal limits of like, okay, what's the average person like weigh? <laughs> um, how much fish do they consume per month, per week? Um, and try to understand um, based on the concentration of the chemical in the fish, what's a safe amount of fish that a person should eat per week. So if it's, let's say you can eat 15 fish meals per week, then it's considered like, all right, this is not a chemical, like the concentration is low, we don't issue an advisory. If it is less than seven, that means you need to have less than seven meals of that fish per week. That's when a fish consumption advisory is triggered, essentially is, you know, it's less than seven, it's reviewed by a risk manager in the Division of Public Health, and then they might issue a consumption advisory. And we'll go through this, what this looks like, because it turns out that the data we collected actually changed um, some of the consumption advisories. So that's the general process. I'll come back to this later, but I just wanted to give you an overview because that's kind of the, the organization of this presentation as well. So first, um, fish tissue sampling, the process. Um, as I mentioned before, you have to figure out where you're gonna sample your fish. You can't just sample them all over. You have to have a specific site. Uh, and so you select your sites, where are you gonna sample? So you have one site, let's say, and then you have to figure out what are the fish we're gonna sample. And you have to make sure you have a fish from kind of higher on the trophic level and lower on the trophic level. It could be high and medium, somewhere in there, but you need two different species. And they can't be you know, both of the same trophic level. Then we need to figure out what are the chemicals we wanna test for. Do I wanna test for mercury? Do I wanna test for chromium? Is it PCBs? This matters because uh, some of those chemicals are really expensive. Um, PFAS, for example, really expensive, and there's a lot of different types. Um, PCBs and dioxins, also a lot more expensive. Um, metals tend to be cheaper, although they're not super cheap, but they are a lot cheaper in compared to a lot of other organic chemicals. So you have to figure out which ones you're gonna analyze and you have to find a lab that analyzes them um, and follows the proper EPA protocols. So that's the essential process. So our first step was identifying sites. Um, as Kiera mentioned, we did these prior surveys to try to figure out what are what fish are people consuming, but also where are they fishing? Uh, and, and where are they gathering fish or getting fish from if they're not fishing themselves, but someone they know is. And so we identified five spots that were kind of commonly fished at. Um, and so we we're trying to find ones that particularly we didn't have a lot of data on, and I'll go into a little bit of this later. Um, but of the five sites we selected, um, so um, near Belleville, Navassa, Wilmington, Castlehane, and Regalwood, we identified a few sites there in the Brunswick River, Cape Fear, and Northeast Cape Fear, um, Burnt Mill Creek, and Davis Creek. Um, what we found is that some of these, so at the Davis Creek um, site, so this is near the boat launch, and then Archie Blue Park um, and Burnt Mill, Burnt Mill Creek had not been sampled before by the DEQ in North Carolina. Um, the last sampling was done in 2013 by the old Kerr-McGee site, um, and that was really only done in the Brunswick River um, near Belleville. So nothing has been, none of these sites have been sampled since 2013, which now is nine years ago. 
Um, but again, a couple of them had never been site, uh, sampled. So we wanted to pick these commonly uh, or popular sites for fishing, but also where there's a lack of data. Next, we had to figure out what fish species we were going to collect. And this is where it's like, all right, we need higher and lower trophic level species. And so we knew we wanted catfish because it's really popular. Um, so we knew we wanted some catfish. And also red drum was relatively popular. Um, and so we collected um, red drum. That was one of the fish we wanted. Um, we also added blue crab um, because it's a popular fish, um, or not fish, shellfish. So even though I'm saying fish, sometimes this includes crab as well. Um, so we knew we wanted to include that because it's commonly consumed. Um, and so we had our different species. Catfish came down to popular catfish, but also uh, which catfish can we collect <laughs> on the day we're sampling um, and that's at the sites. So we had to figure out which fish or crab were at which sites. And so um, the fish that were kind of more brackish water loving, so you have blue crab, um, red drum, uh, we only collected those at kind of near Belleville at the Brunswick River. And then the rest of the fish we collected at more freshwater sites. Um, so near Wilmington at the Burnt Mill Creek, um, Cape Fear River near Regalwood, um, Castle Hayne, Navassa, Davis Creek. Uh, and for some of them, so we sampled, for instance, Bofin and Bluegill at all of the sites, um, all of the uh, freshwater sites. And that's because they're very clearly higher, lower trophic level fish. And so we met that requirement. And then we had the catfish that um, kind of, depending on the type of catfish was higher or lower uh, on the trophic level. So this is a, a lot of information on the slide. I want to distill it for you so it all makes sense. Um, sorry for putting a really large table. We couldn't figure out how to distill it in a simple way that shared all the information we wanted. So we ended up collecting 131 fish that we analyzed for metals. And we'll talk about the, the contaminants um, in a moment. Uh, and um, we sampled at the five sites, as I mentioned before. Um, but we couldn't sample all of the fish at all the sites. We had three species per site. Uh, and so you have the total number of individuals being 131 fish or crabs at each total um, sampled. But some of those end up being in a composite. And that composite can be anywhere from three to seven fish. And so what that means is if you look here, you have the total number of fish we collected, and then we break it down. Did we collect a fillet or a composite? And so you can see near Belleville at the Brunswick River, we collected three composites of blue crab, um, one fillet of blue catfish, and then um, <clears throat> seven fillets of red drum. And so you can see kind of the numbers of how that breaks down. So even though you have 14 blue crab, it only ends up being like three samples that, is, that are analyzed and given kind of part of our assessment for fish consumption advisories. Now you remember that we have to meet certain requirements of the number of fish um, that are sampled, numbers of fillets, and number of composites, and um, high-low trophic level. We met all about trophic level requirements. We had our sites identified, um, but we ended up just because of sampling issues, right? Are the fish there when we're trying to catch them? I and mean, when we went back and tried to catch more, sometimes we struck out a little. And so you can see for blue catfish um, at the Brunswick River, we, we only got one. Um, so sometimes we weren't able to get all of the fish that we needed in order to meet the requirements. So you need to have at least um, uh, five fillets or three composite samples per site. And so what that means is we ended up oops, um, at the site having um, a few samples that didn't meet our requirements or the requirements for state uh, fish consumption advisory considerations. So for blue crab, we had enough samples, but unfortunately we found out afterwards that um, you have to collect the samples within one week. And so ours is a larger time period. And so we didn't meet the time requirement. Uh, so the blue crab didn't count for our analysis. Blue catfish, we didn't have enough. Um, and similarly for blue catfish, even though we had six total individuals, we only had one fillet and one composite because some of the composite ones are smaller catfish. Um, channel catfish, same thing, only two fillets and one composite, and you have to have either five fillets or three composites. So those ones in red didn't qualify for informing the fish consumption advisory data. We're still going to present them here because even though they don't tell us 
you know, we don't have as robust data on it, it does tell us something of what we found, even in our smaller numbers in our analyses. So in terms of why we sampled this, the species we did, um, we, we were pretty thoughtful about it. One, we wanted them to be species that were commonly consumed, and that was based off of the prior data research that had been done. Um, but the other piece was we want to know like what did uh, the DEQ, like what data do we already have? So this graph on the left, I'm going to break these two down for you. Um, the graph on the left, what it's showing is different species of fish that have been sampled in the lower Cape Fear um, since, from 1990 to 2013. And they haven't sampled, the DEQ has not sampled since 2013. So these are the different species that have been sampled since 2013 in Lower Cape Fear, and then on um, the kind of y-axis, the right of the or left of the graph, is the number of samples of each species. The ones highlighted in blue are the ones that we sampled. And so what you can see is we have a lot of data. Um, we being the DEQ has a lot of data on largemouth bass. Um, it's pretty heavily sampled, even though it's commonly consumed. We didn't we didn't sample it because we have a lot of data, relatively speaking, on large marked bass. But we wanted to add those fish that weren't as commonly consumed. So you have red drum, channel catfish, flathead, and blue catfish, um, blue crab as well. Bluegill and bowfin had a little bit higher um, numbers sampled, um, but uh, still um, wanted to look at them um, because, again, they're good trophic indicators. The graph on the right here shows similar data, so same DQ sampled fish from the lower Cape Fear, but it shows it by year, and then the colors represent different species. And so what you can see is the ones that are mostly sampled are these greens, that's bluegill and bowfin. Um, so those are the two, we see that right in the graph on the left. Um, but you can see here that we haven't really sampled in, in red drum, it was just a few um, that were sampled in 2013. And those were sampled only um, at the old by the old Kermagee site um, near Belleville. And so we don't have any data about red drum elsewhere, um, which is the main place to sample um, because of brackish waters, but still we wanted to add more data um, for let's say blue crab um, and other catfish. So channel flathead and uh, blue catfish. So, Abby, go ahead. So, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the chemical contaminants we chose to test for and um, a little background about why we chose those chemicals. So, we looked for three different metals arsenic, chromium, and mercury. And um, Kiara kind of alluded to the fact that these three chemicals have already had fish advisory consum consumption advisories because we know that they do exist. Um, in fish, especially in the Lower Cape Fear River. So we picked those as a kind of priority contaminants. We also wanted to look for some non-metals um, and we chose um, two chemical classes called PCBs and dioxins. We wanted to look for these because we know there are PCBs in um, the Lower Cape Fear and in some Superfund sites in the area, but there's virtually no um, data about their chemical concentrations in fish. We know that all of these chemicals are persistent in the area. We know they have a toxicity and we know that they have a tendency to bioaccumulate. And that's especially true for PCBs and dioxins, which are chemicals, again, we don't have a lot of information for in fish. There's definitely a lot of information about mercury in the fish in the area, but um, less so for chromium and, mercury, or chromium and arsenic. Um, we had a budget that allowed us to analyze all of these chemicals. And um, like I said, there were health advisories for the metals um, and a potential to create a health advisory for the non-metals because we didn't know what the concentrations in fish were. I just wanted to give you a little bit more background too on the different kinds of metals that exist in the environment. Um, because I feel like sometimes you hear about um, like chromium and chrome sticks or mercury and methylmercury, and they do have different toxicities. Um, and their, um, how do I want to say this? Their presence in the environment can mean sometimes different things. 
So we assumed that um, the inorganic arsenic was assumed to be 10% of the total arsenic. And that I believe, um, Mashkun, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the inorganic arsenic is not as to toxic as the rest of the arsenic that we would find. So we assumed um, that 10% of the arsenic we're measuring is, is non-toxic. But in terms of chromium, we had to assume that all of it was hexavalent chromium, which is the very toxic version of chromium. Um, and there are a few reasons why we did that. And I guess if we have some time for questions, um, I'm happy to talk about um, why we made some assumptions about these chemicals that we did. Um, and if we wanna to go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit more about the impacts of the pollution of these chemicals. So we know all of these chemicals exist in the lower Cape Fear. They come from Superfund sites, energy production, um, all kinds of industrial production that we know is in the area, quarries, landfills, they come from, they kind of get recycled around consumer products and then they we put them into landfills and they come back into the environment. And they also, even though they get phased out, they tend to stick to soil or they get into the water and then they spread over several decades um, and continue to persist in the environment, which is certainly the case with um, PCBs and dioxins. And as they exist in the environment, they have a tend to what we call bioaccumulate. And that's how they get into fish and shellfish. And then because of those properties, they stick in the fish. When we eat them, they accumulate in us as humans. So the problem with that is they're toxic, right? Mercury has neurological effects. A lot of these chemicals have neurological effects. They can cause cancer. Um, they can cause all kinds of other health issues. Um, they have immunocompromising issues, reproductive problems. And that makes them, um, that's why we also set different regulations for vulnerable populations. So because some of these compounds can have neurological effects or um, reproductive health effects, they can especially affect um, pregnant women differently or their um, developing visas or small children who are trying to um, grow healthy and have um, and grow their brains in a healthy way. So if they're, if they're exposed to some of these metals early on, um, it can hamper their development. And so kind of getting into the levels of contaminants that we found in these sampled fish, I will talk about the non-metal results and then I'll pass it back to Moshkan to talk about what we found with metals. So the good news is these PCBs and dioxins in the, lower cave, in the fish of the lower Cape Bear were rarely ever um, detected. We did not detect dioxins in any of the fish that we tested, which is excellent news because those are the most toxic chemicals that we looked for. We did find some PCBs in some of the fish that we found, but if you run those through some of the screening level calculations that Moshman alluded to earlier, we found that the concentrations were 10 times lower than um, would set an alert for looking further into screening. Um, which kind of led us to believe, we can stay here for a sec, that the, the metals were really driving the toxicity of, of what's going on in fish in the lower Cape Bear River. So just because we didn't find PCBs and dioxins doesn't mean that we shouldn't set health advisories because it really is metals that are driving the um, toxicity in fish. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on what it means, if you want to go to the next slide, what it means to have a non-detect. So, just because we didn't detect any of these chemicals in these fish doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. So I kind of wanted to walk through um, how these fish are analyzed. And usually like Mojman said, we take a filet or the whole fish and we composite them. And then we extract them in some kind of solvent. And then we have a lab analyze those usually on a GC mass spec or, um, for metals, it's a, um, an ICP. But what that does is we, these fish have a, a number of chemicals in them. We extract them, we try and get all of that chemical out, and then we separate them by instruments through certified labs. And what happens is, is we get these kind of squiggly lines or these chromatograms, those is what we call them, 
And even though it's present, you don't always see a big peak, which is how we quantify everything. But if there's enough of that chemical, you'll see this big, beautiful peak that you can then create a reliable number with. So with, that's what we call the concentration. So even though there's no peak there, it doesn't always mean that that chemical is not there. And this is why sometimes we need to do composite samples because these little fish don't give us enough, uh, there's not enough chemical in each individual fish to get a reliable peak, but sometimes there is. Um, so we went forward with this, um, knowing that even though we didn't really have good numbers for PCBs and dioxins, because when we ran through the calculations based on the mass we extracted of fish, we were still well below the screening level. So we didn't feel that we needed to catch more fish and composite them to get more reliable numbers because we felt very confident that um, the non-metals were not gonna drive toxicity in, in this work. And because we were getting so many um, measurements from the metals that would really drive um, consumption rates for these measurements. And I will pass it back to Mashkan to tell you more about what she found with metals. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Abby. Um, so uh, with the metals, we had, so we only had five fish that we analyzed for PCBs, um, but we had the 131, but in 57 different composites and fillets for the metals um, and arsenic, which is a metalloid, but it's a metal term. Um, and uh, so we have a lot more data. Uh, that's the first of it. So, um, so what I want to show now is what are the levels we found? And so for each of the three metals, I'm, you're going to see a graph like this. So this has um, the different species of fish and crab that we sampled. Uh, so it's all the sites combined together. And uh, it shows then the concentration of the metal. Uh, for arsenic, um, as Abby had mentioned, we, uh, we actually take, we only measure total arsenic, total mercury, total chromium, um, but we took uh, 10% of the total arsenic, and we assume that's the inorganic arsenic. And so uh, the numbers then are really small um, because you're assuming 10%. Um, so it looks a little messier because they're tiny, uh, but that's the standard protocol that's used by the EPA. Uh, and so we're assuming 10% is inorganic arsenic, that's the toxic type. And so we then have on here um, the screening levels. Screening levels are split up by um, the health effect it causes. So does it cause cancer? So cancer effects or non-cancer effects? Um, cancer effects screening levels are always lower than the non-cancer screening levels. And that's because if something causes cancer, any amount of it is bad. Because if you're exposed to just a tiny amount of it, it increases your risk of cancer a tiny bit, right? So you want those levels to be as close to zero as possible. And again, like we don't, oftentimes we can't get zero, um, but you're trying to go as low as possible. So the screening level for cancer is set really low. So in this graph, you can see this orange line, it looks like it's at zero. That is the screening level for cancer effects for inorganic arsenic. In red is the non-cancer effects screening level. And so what you can see here is actually, um, this is the average for the different types of species that blue catfish and blue crab indicated because they didn't meet, um, the fish consumption advisories recommendations, but you still can see they're here. Um, but all of the samples, all of the individual um, fillets and composites exceeded the screening level for cancer for inorganic arsenic. Um, they didn't, for the most part, exceed the non-cancer effects. Only five bofin from Burnt Mill Creek exceeded the level for non-cancer effects. You don't see them on here because this is an average. So they were um, higher than about 0.2. So a fair bit higher than the screening level. If you look at chromium, chromium is similar to arsenic in that it causes cancer. So you have the cancer screening level and um, a non-cancer effect screening level. Um, but also we assumed, as um, Abby mentioned, that we measure total chromium. And we assume all of it is hexavalent chromium. The screening level is only for hexavalent chromium. We assume that because it's really toxic. Uh, and so we want to just you know, this, the government at least, and we want to be the most protective. And there's good reason to believe that, you know, a good chunk of this might actually be hexavalent chromium. 
we'll talk about that a little later too. Um, but what you see here, this is the um, cancer screening level. Um, all of them, uh, the averages, as well as each individual sample exceeded the cancer screening level for hexavalent chromium. Um, none of them exceeded the non-cancer effects. So it's a cancer one that's of most concern. Um, and it was highest in Bofin um, and Red Drum um, specifically. If you look at mercury, this is what most of the data um, for fish consumption advisory comes from is mercury. And so um, mercury, as bad as it is, does not cause cancer. Um, it has lots of other bad things um, that it um, can impact health. Um, so there's only a non-cancer screening level. And what you see here is actually almost all of our samples, all of them on average by species of fish, but also all individual samples except for one exceeded the uh, screening level for mercury. Uh, and Bofin um, had the highest. Again, we weren't really surprised because it's higher in the trophic level um, and other data had kind of indicated that, but we did see pretty high levels as you can see in the other catfish and in red drum, which is not what we had known before. And that's really what we wanna go into is we've gone through these screening levels and try to figure that out. Because remember, um, we want to figure out, like, based on what we found in these fish, how does that inform the consumption advisories? And like, how do you reduce the chemical exposures you're going to get? So you remember this flow chart here? Um, this was a screening review. That's essentially what we just went through, right? If it was below this, no advisory is issued. But what we saw, right, is that actually most of our samples exceeded either a cancer screening level or for mercury, just the non-cancer one. And so that means we have to then calculate meal limits and figure out what's a safe amount and does that trigger an advisory. So uh, we have to, the, the amount kind of a meal is considered about six ounces. And so um, we wanted to see, you know, what are the old advisories and then what are the meal limits we would calculate, right? So, this is showing the prior fish consumption advisory guidelines. And the guidelines are split up by kind of everyone, or any, I should say, vulnerable populations first, which is pregnant women, women of childbearing age, women who are nursing, um, as well as children under the age of 15. They're all under the vulnerable population category. Everyone else is the other population. And so, the recommendations are different because a lot of those chemicals can cause neurological impacts um, and can pass to the developing fetus. And so we want to be really protective of them. So we have this recommendation for all other populations than vulnerable populations. And these are just the species we sampled. And the gray font is like the ones we didn't have enough. Um, we didn't meet the guidelines for for the FCA sampling. So we calculated um, the Division of Public Health in North Carolina puts forth like how you calculate meal limits. And there's a bunch of information, average weight of a person, consumption, right? all that stuff we've mentioned before. And so you can calculate based on each contaminant and the contaminant level, the average level in catfish or in bofin, whatever it is, um, what the average level uh, or the average meal limit recommendation is. And this we did per for all sites combined together, but you could break it out by site as well. And so this is just the general population that there's only a calculation for the general population. And what you can see here is mercury for non cancer effects, you do a, a meal limit for the screening level like cancer effects non cancer effects. So mercury non cancer effects, you can see um, just looking at this stuff here. It ranges depending on the species from one to about five meal limits is what's recommended for mercury based on non-cancer effects. For arsenic, largely didn't actually, the levels were really low, um, again, based on that 10% estimate, um, and there was no limit based on arsenic. For uh, bofin and blue crab, there were some limits um, because of arsenic. Again, saying some limits, all it has to do is be less than seven. If it's over than seven, then there's no limit. That's when it says no limit. And then chromium has only one. So we have these different contaminants, different metals, and they you calculate a different um, meal limit based on each contaminant in the screening level for cancer or not. And we just looked at cancer effects for arsenic and chromium because they're the most restricted. That's what we care about. So from here, like we got to figure out, okay, well, what's the most restrictive, right? 
And chromium was the most restrictive. For all species we sampled, it was about one um, meal limit. Um, and uh, for uh, mercury, for uh, bofin, that one was also one. These are rounded numbers. We kind of rounded, so some of them were like 0 0.8, 0 0.9, some were 1.1, and we rounded to about, you know, to the nearest number. And so what that means is you then figure out what's the most restrictive of all of those contaminants. And so for these, all these sites, the most restrictive recommendation is only one meal of these per week. Uh, and so if we break that down, you can see that these don't necessarily align with the old consumption advisories for the general population, which is non-vulnerable. So this is similar information, but what we're showing here is, uh, let's see, sorry, when these are a little slow to show up, um, is there was differences for channel catfish, bowfin, um, bluegill, and red rum. There are some significant differences in the consumption advisories um, that were recommended. Now, what you remember seeing is we had one for all of these. Some of these are zero, and that's because these are the advisories that were set um, by the uh, Division of Public Health in North Carolina. And uh, sometimes they, you know, when we took 0.8 and we rounded to one, they rounded down to be more protective. And part of this was us learning, like, how do they actually do this? We don't actually know kind of the you know, there's the what's the inner workings happening in the Division of Public Health that we don't see. Uh, so you can see here um, the uh, the recommendations um, go from one to zero for channel catfish and bofin, um, and then for bluegill and red drum, it's much more different, right? We're talking about for all other populations, four meals per week going down to one or zero, um, and they're only specific to the sites that we sampled. We didn't sample red drum, right? We only did it um, near Belleville at the Brunswick River, so we can only say right there. Same thing for channel catfish, it was only at near Regal Wood. So these are the new uh, fish consumption advisories. You saw this graphic, um, Kiara shared it um, before, uh, and you can see in red, these are the new ones, and it's largely based off of uh, hexavalent chromium. Uh, and so, we had it, right? The only one that was informed by hexavalent chromium was striped bass um, because of the Kermagee study in uh, 2013. Um, so this adds a lot of kind of new uh, data and how we understand what's the risk in the fish. That being said, um, there are a lot of limitations on how we understand this. And so I just wanted to go over that. Um, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Kiara, but um, when we think of the limitations, um, there are a few of them we want to highlight. So first, the advisories are only to go back here. That's for all other populations. Um, we don't yet have an advisory for vulnerable populations for uh, based on the data we collected. This method of how the Division of Public Health um, calculates and figures out what the recommendation is for vulnerable population isn't, isn't publicly distributed um, that we could find at least. Um, so we don't have data on that. Uh, so we don't know how they're calculating that, um, but likely it's gonna be more restrictive than it is for the general population that's not vulnerable. Uh, the other thing, and we, Abby and I kind of alluded to this, is we tested total chromium, total arsenic, total mercury. Hexavalent chromium is what's guiding a lot of these new recommendations that are a lot more restrictive, right? One fish meal per week. Um, for non-vulnerable populations. We don't actually know if all of the chromium we measured is hexavalent or not. We actually tried, I should mention this, we tried to measure hexavalent chromium. Um, we used a method um, that was used in like the lab. It, there isn't a good method to analyze hexavalent chromium in uh, fish. And so we were unable to do it. We tried, but we couldn't. Um, so uh, that means that we don't have that data. We're assuming 100% is hexavalent chromium. That's what the EPA recommends, the Division of Public Health recommends, uh, but we don't actually know. Now, if it's less than that, 10 or less than 100% is hexavalent chromium, that means we're actually being more protective than we should be, right? Um, but if it's 100%, then we're doing exactly what we should be. 
Um, there is some evidence to show that um, a lot of the chromium in fish tends to be um, hexavalent chromium in some areas. And so um, I think it's a good practice to assume that it's likely hexavalent chromium. Um, so it's just an acknowledgement. I'm not exactly sure, but that's where we're at. Um, we also couldn't in consider the results on blue crab and blue catfish. Um, we know they're really important. We wish we had that data, um, but we don't have it. I think it's something we want to look at um, and encourage other people to look at in the future. Um, we also only looked at specific locations. Those five locations in the advisories are set, be it for that specific location. It doesn't apply for all of the lower Cape Fear. Um, and it would be really nice if we had more data um, across the lower Cape Fear as well on more species. Um, we only tested certain species, right? Um, the advisories, and I think this is one of the things someone who's in environmental health that really is difficult, is the advisories are based on each of these things, each of these contaminants alone, right? We're assuming you're only exposed to hexavalent chromium based on that screening level. We don't look at hexavalent chromium and mercury and arsenic all cumulatively together and say, oh, based on these three things, this is your risk. Uh, we say, okay, this is your risk based off of chromium and this is your risk based off of mercury. And then we regulate based on that, make recommendations based on that. And that's not right. You're a whole person. Those are whole fish. Uh, and so you're exposed to all those things. So we miss that. The other thing is that we only, I mean, we mostly analyzed for mercury, arsenic, and chromium. We did a little bit on PCBs and dioxins, but there are other chemicals that we know are concerned. Um, PFAS, for example, is one of them. Uh, PAHs is another. Um, so not only is it not cumulative, but we're also missing these other contaminants. So it's sometimes a difficult thing to try to figure out, how do we make sense of this? Um, but we try to be as protective as we can, and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, if people have questions about how do we think about risks. I'm gonna pass it to Kira and talk about kind of the, how do we communicate all of this? Thanks, Mushkan and Abby both um, feel like every time I hear y'all talk about this, I kind of pick up on a new tidbit of information. So uh, thanks for going through all of that. Um, so the kind of implications of all of this research for all of y'all, the general public, um, is that we were able to, uh, back several years ago, like I mentioned, generate this social marketing campaign um, that we refer to as Stop, Check, and Enjoy. Um, and over the years since, we have been able to revise and edit uh, an update based on uh, not only new fish tissue analysis um, results, but also on based on focus groups and surveys and gathering more information about what works and what doesn't work. Um, but I will actually drop a link in the chat to uh, the entirety of these materials. Um, essentially, the Stop, Check, Enjoy campaign, um, these three words that we chose are specific to the messaging that we're trying to get across. Um, so I will show in just a minute some of our materials, most of our materials contain um, images and graphics of fish uh, that we would put in the stop category, meaning that uh, these are not fish that you should be consuming if you can help it. Um, check would fall in the fish that would fall into the check category would be uh, fish that is kind of dependent on um, your demographic characteristics, how much of this fish that you're eating. Um, but we would recommend just kind of checking the advisories before you choose to consume, because based on the geographic area that you're in or the population that you fall into, um, you might want to avoid consuming these fish. Um, enjoy. It's pretty much a green light. So um, regardless of where you are geographically or um, regardless of what population you fall into, it's a pretty safe bet that you can enjoy these fish. Um, and again, based on uh, the results that we have, those are tend to be kind of smaller, younger fish. Um, but we have, you'll see on the left of the screen here, uh, we have posters um, that we have uh, generated. Yeah, you can go to the next one. Um, some of our other materials are uh, on the left, we have a wallet card. Um, in the middle, we have a recipe calendar. Um, on the right, we have a magnet that teaches you how to fillet fish. That's one of our recommendations for avoiding, especially those fat loving contaminants like PCBs. Um, and so it walks you through step by step. That calendar in the middle has proven to be really um, 
useful to folks because what it does is it gives you um, recipes based around the fish that we would say uh, have a green light attached to them. Um, as implied by the left hand, the wallet card, we also have all of these materials in Spanish. So these are our printed stop, check, enjoy materials. Um, again, you can go through all of those on the website. Um, we've also put together a social media toolkit for those of y'all who make use of social media or who are on social media. Um, and basically the toolkit walks through a series of posts that were generated, um, images, graphics, um, all of those really good crucial uh, messages that get at the heart of what we're trying to communicate, but in social media form. So for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram primarily, um, attached to each of the images is a suggested caption. There are plenty of hashtags for folks to use, um, and it kind of gives suggestions for how to post these and in what, what order and combination. As well, we have a video series with some local celebrities, some of whom are on this call. Um, and these video series are also at the link that I sent you. And essentially, um, there's one that is kind of a community oriented general PSA um, about the fish consumption work featuring Deborah Dix Maxwell, president of the North Carolina NAACP, uh, and Veronica Carter as well, uh, Coastal Federation Council person of Leland. Um, and these are kind of um, the messages within these. This video is like a really wonderful overview of kind of everything that we we uh, are trying to communicate with the Stop Check and Joy campaign. Um, our video featuring Chef Keith Rhodes um, is more oriented towards uh, how you can actually prepare and cook fish to be able to reduce your contaminant exposure. You can. All right, uh, yeah, I think on that one, which I might actually go ahead and share real quick, I just added it really fast because I did want to mention just in our last few minutes um, that in this month of March, uh, what we are doing is we are having what's called a fish consumption month. Uh, and so we're basically trying to do one big push uh, to get all of our Stop, Check, Enjoy materials messaging out into the world. Um, so we are uh, distributing printed materials in as many locations as we possibly Possibly can. Um, we are doing holding some webinars like this one. Uh, we have another one coming up for the NC Coastal Federation towards the end of the month. Um, we are hopefully going to be on the radio. Some of y'all who are uh, frequently driving around the Wilmington area might see that we have billboards up, electronic billboards um, that can communicate our messaging. Um, and then our biggest uh, kind of fish consumption month event is we have our Go Fish event happening on March 27th at the New Hanover County Arboretum. Uh, it is open to the general public. Um, we are going to have food trucks, we'll have music, we'll have speakers, we'll have games. And then of course, all of our community partners are going to be uh, present distributing some of their materials, uh, talking about our Stop, Check, Enjoy materials and fish consumption in general. So um, I hope that you all can, can join us for that. It should be a really great event. And again, I will drop a link in the chat for some more information about our fish consumption month and that event specifically. Turn it back right. to Marissa. Yeah, so thank you so much, you guys. Um, and I think that's a great segue into, um, we do have Dean Neff, um, chef and owner of Seabird Restaurant on our call and council member Veronica Carter. And so we wanted to give them a little bit of time as well to talk about their involvement in this project and how they are taking that back to their, um, their constituents or their um, attendees at the restaurant. So um, I think it looks like, Dean, do you wanna start? Um, do you just kind of wanna chat about um, your involvement in this project and how you see um, this moving forward? Sure. Happy Fish Consumption Month, everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name's Dean. Um, I think a lot of times I kind of glaze over like exactly what I do or what where I've come from. And, um, I think one thing that's important for me to mess or to, to mention in all of this is my um, work has always kind of been with community restaurants. And um, to me, a community restaurant is like a little bit different than just, I don't know, kind of like a chain restaurant in the sense that it has sort of a, like a, an identity in place. And a lot of the, the food that we use it's in the restaurant, the brand is really defined by the community and the, farmers and the fishermen 
and um, we kind of create this loop of of information that goes from these people that we meet who are doing exciting things with food and ingredients. And then oftentimes the people that come into the restaurant, we're able to sort of communicate that back to the guests. And it's interesting because I think a lot of times um, of something that happens, like when there's a story behind an ingredient or a farmer um, that's bringing you the ingredient and you can communicate that to somebody dining in the restaurant, it really kind of changes the whole um, experience for the person who is eating in the restaurant because they, they have, they understand this ingredient in a deeper level. They understand your relationship with maybe the person that brought you that ingredient and sort of the thought process and trying not to mess up an ingredient that's really special and has been brought to you by someone in the community. Um, and so I thought that, you know, so I've worked in, in this great restaurant in Athens, Georgia, which is kind of where I got this sense of community restaurant when I was first out of culinary school and I've been fortunate enough to kind of be involved in in a lot of uh, you know restaurants like this since then and the latest restaurant Seabird um, is primarily seafood focused um, and you know one thing about moving to the Wilmington area that was really inspiring for me was just the the abundance of seafood and um, you know the fact that it's seasonal and the fact that there are these people who are you know farming oysters and out foraging um, things and, and, you know, uh, all, all the different fish, you know, we see different fish, different seasons and, um, and something that we kind of, I've learned along the way of, of cooking is that a lot of times, um, kind of bad news about practices and farming, whether it's, you know, commodity farming or, um, environmental, you know, issues associated with environment, commodity farming and, and big production, um, there is a, an opportunity a lot of times in the market for people to uh, kind of come in and do things in a better, more thoughtful way. And so those are oftentimes kind of the, the, the times where we, we find ingredients that are really special. Um, an example here in Wilmington, we have this, this partner and um, this wonderful friend, Anna Shellam, and she is kind of a, a small batch coastal forager. And she works really strictly with, you know, the, the regulations on, on how much she should be foraging from certain areas. She brings us oysters and whelk and mussels and clams. And she's out there like every day and is super in tune with the, with the environment and the season. And um, she, she cares about what she does. And it really shows just in the conversations that we have with her. Um, and so I kind of feel like this, this campaign is, is really, um, important to me because this is again another story of food in our community and um, it's not necessarily good news but um, I feel like there is an opportunity here especially with this wonderful marketing campaign that's been created um, with the stop check and joy campaign I mean it's like it's got this great logo with the fish with the the traffic light on it and um, it's super smart I think it, it like it gets your attention, it starts a conversation. And so my hope is that, um, you know, at the restaurant, we can figure out a way to start this conversation and to bring awareness to this, but also to, you know, this, I feel like this is still in the very early stages and we're still learning a lot and the, you know, science is a process. And so we have to, you know, we're here now, but we need to get to a place where we have a more comprehensive understanding of exactly what's happening. And so, you know, my goal is to do whatever I can to help kind of get the message out because this is a serious community, um, you know, issue and, and message that everyone in this community needs to hear. And so, you know, we're going to do everything we can to kind of get the word out to the people that we can reach. And, um, you know, I just think that this is, it's, I'm so thankful, you know, that all of everyone has been working on this and has been so diligent over the past several years to really, you know, help bring awareness to what's going on. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much all I have really, but I'm, I'm, you know, super thankful to be a part of this. And um, this is kind of, you know, again, another story of food and we're going to, you know, get the word out to everyone we can. Awesome. Thank you. And if you guys have not been to Seabird Restaurant before, it is amazing. So you all should Thanks. go take a visit. Um, all right, and then, um, and Veronica, if you have just a couple things to say as well about how this, how you've been involved in this project and um, how this impacts you and the town of Leland, um, that would be great. 
Sure, it doesn't necessarily impact the town of Leland because I got started on this long before um, I was going to be on town council. This all started for, uh, give you all the background, when um, Cape Fear River Watch, the Coastal Federation, uh, Pender Watch, and a number of the NAACP in New Hanover County were all trying to stop Titan Cement from uh, putting a cement factory on the Cape Fear River, the Northeast Cape Fear River. And while we were fighting this and we realized it was an environmental justice issue because not only were they citing it in an environmental justice community, but as we would try to get regulators, both from DEQ and EPA, out to the sites along the Cape Fear River, we would see families fishing, or we would see people that we knew were not catching, releasing. Um, and we would say something like, you know, you gotta, you gotta try to clean up the river, not make it worse, not allow them to put one more thing on the river that's gonna pollute it even more. And some of you are probably old enough to remember when they were gonna classify the Cape Fear River as a swamp um, because of all of the various pollutants. And so we were busy trying to convince them that people were eating the fish and they're saying, there's no way anybody's eating fish out of that river. And uh, we said, sure they are, look. And they said, no, that's anecdotal. You gotta have like a peer reviewed scientific study. Well, what you just heard was a peer reviewed scientific study from two very great scientists and we thank them, but it took us a while to get to that place. And so um, in the first chart that you saw on the timeline, it said there was an EJ grant, an environmental justice grant. That was actually an environmental justice EPA problem solving grant. And our problem was that we didn't have a scientific study to say that people were actually eating the fish out of the Cape Fear River. And so uh, we started getting with uh, the Duke School for Community Engagement. Um, initially, we had Wake Forest involved in this. Uh, North Carolina State at, at some point has been involved in this. And so it was just been an evolving type of thing. Because here's the bottom line. As much as we want to show folks that people are eating the fish out of the Cape Fear River because they need the fish to supplement their um, their diets. They're not eating them just because they enjoy fish. I'm sure they do, but most of the people who are environmental justice are poor socioeconomically um, challenged communities eat those fish because they need that supplement of uh, supplemental protein. You're not going to tell those people don't eat the fish, okay? What are you going to give them instead? So we, if you can eat some fish as opposed to other fish because those some fish are less toxic and, and less deadly and less dangerous, so much the better, okay? And I'm remiss because I forgot to mention your incredibly great river keeper, Kemp, who we call our EJ brother. I say we, um, Deborah Dix Maxwell is one of my EJ sisters, uh, along with some folks like um, um, Ashley Daniels, I think you folks know. And um, we, we call ourselves the little EJ crew here with the problem solver, fight, crime fighters, et cetera. Dana Sargent's been involved from the beginning as well. I'm looking around to see who else is on the, the call. Um, but that gives you an idea. So we uh, reached out to Duke and said, we need some help. And they started assembling this wonderful team of scientists with the initial problem solving grant where we could send people out to the community and go actually people who weren't intimidating, oh, by the way, because if I'm fishing on the side of the river trying to supplement my income, or lack of income. And here comes some, no offense to any of you out there, white person shows up and goes, hey, what are you doing fishing? First thing I'm thinking is they're looking to see if I have a license. And next thing is they're not, they, you know, they may wanna like take me away and see if I'm documented and all this other stuff. So we needed to make sure that these were people that they were gonna feel comfortable talking to. And so that was the first part of the survey and the first part of going in and getting community people to go to community places. One of the reasons that we have those certain fishing holes those certain places that we talked about is because we knew that's where people were, went to fish in the neighborhoods. And so um, there's another reason, oh, by the way, why the, the DEQ stopped fishing in 2013. And I'm, all I'm gonna say as a political science major is go see who was in charge of the North Carolina government starting in the year 2013. That's all I'm gonna say, okay? And, and realize what happened to DEQ and we'll leave it at that for this morning. Um, but we went to those places we got people to talk to them. We did questionnaires. We got to see who was eating the fish. And yes, they were eating the fish. And when you watch the video, you'll hear Deborah, who's a, a native of the area, talk about how when her dad bought fish home from the Cape Fear River, when people brought fish home, and they still do that today, they it's not just that their household eats the fish, but if they have a really good day, they call up their friends and neighbors and go, hey, I got, I got some fish down here. You need some fish? And so the whole neighborhood 
starts eating the fish. It's not just the one fisherman or fisher family, if you will. And so it's so important to get a hold of those folks and get them talking to you. So that was the first part of the study. The next part was to find out if the fish were contaminated, what they were contaminated from. Oh, by the way, this started before we even found PFAS. Good grief. Now we got one more thing to worry about in the river. Okay. On top of all the heavy metals that are in there. So that's why PFAS really hasn't come up yet. One, it's expensive. And two, this started while we were doing all this, PFAS was like, oh, great, something else to go in the river. We literally were standing at Lake Sut uh, Sutton Lake with uh, folks from the EPA Region 4, and folks walked up to us, and y'all know that that's the cooling ponds for the coal ash, and this is before they started moving the coal ash out of there. And somebody walked up to us and said, hey, y'all going fishing? And I looked at the ladies and went, no, nobody fishes here. And I said, oh, by the way, where's the fish, the signs, the fish advisory signs? There were none at the time. And it took us a while, I say us, all of us who've been part of this group, to figure out how to put, how to get a fish advisory sign up. You know, our, our scientists are being very uh, humble right now this morning, because that cute little flow chart thing that looks like, you know, a Gantt chart or something, they had to figure that out because it did not exist prior to this study. You couldn't just call, you know, Health and Human Services at, at North Carolina DHHS and say, hey, I need a fish consumption study. I have these, uh, nobody really could give you a good answer. So this has been a very long slug. Now, people like Dean and Dean um, uh, Chef Keith Rhodes gave their time and their talent. You know, you have time, talent, and treasure. They gave their time and their talent to this study because we realized no matter what we found, we had to give people an alternative because they were they're still going to eat the fish. Yeah, this is North Carolina. If we could figure out how to fry water, we would. So we needed something that would take the good fish and make them taste good. So that way people will eat the good fish, right? And we need to teach them how to properly clean their fish and fillet their fish so they get the fatty bad parts off and eat only the better part, the healthier parts. And that's where Dean and um, um, Keith came in. Those calendars that they, they talked about have recipes that these guys worked on every month that are in English and Spanish. And so that they could take their talent and figure out how to make it taste good. If you've been to their restaurants, both of them are just incredibly talented, wonderful guys, but they're also both great and talented and wonderful community oriented guys. They shared their talent with us on those calendars. And so those calendars are both English and Spanish. And we've been giving them out at uh, Hispanic and Latino churches, um, the African-American churches, all of the places we think that we can get the most bang for our buck, particularly in the communities that need it the most. So that's a quick overall of why we do this, what we're doing and how it all got started. And now I'll turn it back over and see if we have any questions. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all of our speakers to Kiara and Moshkan and Abby and Veronica and Dean. Um, really appreciate you guys taking time to come out and um, chat with the community this morning. Um, we are going to open it up to questions. Um, so if any of you have questions for any of our speakers, um, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can um, post questions in the chat box. I have a question. This is Valerie Robertson. Um, I live near Burnt Mill Creek, and on occasion I see people fishing. And... I'm always distressed because I don't know their intent for the fish and I don't know how to approach someone and warn them. And so I just don't know what to do. So I'm curious to know whether anybody has any suggestions. If, if I just see people fishing in public, should I just walk away? Should I, if, if there's a sign, I could start a conversation around the sign. Anyway, uh, suggestions welcome. I'll take that one, um, Valerie. I see people fishing a lot when I'm running around doing various things. And what mm -hmm. I'll usually do is just strike up a conversation and say, hey, you know, catch anything? You know, and if they, you know, that, that fishermen love to tell you what they've caught and if they haven't caught anything, right? And you say, hey, you gonna take right. them home and cook them? And, and that brings the next question. If they say, no, I'm just catch and release, then you don't have to worry about anything, right? And if they say, yeah, I'm going to cook them. And then I say, go to, I say, hey, you got a phone? You got a smartphone? Do me a favor. Google smart, check, and enjoy. 
Okay. 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 I'll tell them Google smart check and enjoy. It's going to give you a lot of good information about like fish advisories, which fish are good, which fish are not so good to eat because you know, some of them are dangerous and then yeah. it'll give you some good recipes too. And they'll go, Oh, wow. I mean, I've actually had a guy in a boat pull out his phone in the boat. I was worried he going to drop his phone in the water and, and check it out to see, you know, if I was making it up. But it, it just, you know, it doesn't take but less than a minute and you can jump right in there. OK, if that sure. helps. Any. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh, it will. Yeah. Because then it's not me being judgmental. It's me being informational and a neighbor. Valerie, I'd love to jump in there. Um, this is Dana Sargent and just. Um, I think one of the biggest things here, and I think Veronica's spot on in saying these researchers have been very humble, um, as has Veronica and Dean as well. I jumped onto this in 2019 after tons of work had already been done. So, um, but I think we do need more signage um, and we need to, we need to work on that. And, and we need, I mean, along with the efforts to, to get PFAS consumption advisories and other things, we just watched how difficult it was, how much work had to go into all of this. Um, to get these advisories in place, and the signage alone is is a red hot mess. And so there there has been there last year there was a grant written by NC State um, that was actually aimed at and geared toward sort of coalescing that process, that big uh, that big uh, slide that Moshkan showed into something that actually makes sense. So um, there is work being done on it, um, and and you know I think if the funding was there. Um, we could definitely get more signage out and, and that's something we need to work on. I see Ed had your hand up. Was that, did you have a question? Hi, we went walking yesterday or two days ago, three of us and uh, the fishermen down there at Archie Blue couldn't catch anything that day. Um, we didn't get into the, are you going to uh, take them home with you or not? But um, I want to point out that Archie Blue is right next to the dump. Um, and uh, that um, around the bend on uh, Smith Creek, there's another dump. And both of those are closed, unmonitored, on everything. Um, so I'd like to ask the scientists, um, are we being, um, are, are we being, uh, um, is there is something wrong with the science if you uh, do your testing next to a dump? You know, we actually, uh, we wanted to test near sources of contamination like a dump right so we actually wanted to test near where we knew there was pollution because that's where we were thinking you might see higher levels of them the pollution runs off into the water gets in the sediment and then that's how you know it ends up moving up the food chain and gets in fish so that was intentional because we want to we want to know like how bad is it right um i would say that i don't we only tested for certain things. So there are other things that might, like other chemicals that might be a problem related to the dump or other pollution sources. And we didn't test for all the possible chemicals. So we're only testing for the things, the metals um, and some of the PCBs and dioxins. So there's a lot more out there where we might be missing, but we're trying to see like in a site that we know is gonna be bad, but people are fishing there, how bad is it? Um, we didn't wanna go to a site that we already like, we don't know of any contamination nearby because that's one where we assume it might be better. I do think it'd be great to have that data too. Um, we just, we only could do five sites. So we were trying to, you know, use our resources most efficiently, unless you're asking something else. I'm not. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a follow, mm -hmm. uh, follow up question of Shara. Um, you said it costs a lot of money to do um, testing for, um, PFAS, and uh, I thought that the legislature had dumped a ton of money into the system for people to do uh, testing for PFAS. And uh, have you, is Duke uh, after any of that money in, in uh, making grant requests? And if not, why not? And how soon? You want to go? 
I could speak to that a little bit. So um, the North Carolina reg, uh, legislature did dump millions of dollars into better understanding the PFAS problem around the state. Um, Duke certainly was a part of that. Um, and I was on that team and what Duke's part did um, was we measured PFAS in drinking water from every source in the state and quantified um, 47 different PFAS chemicals. We also did some kind of very high science-y non-target work to see if there were PFAS chemicals that we don't know about. Um, there was another team at NC State that um, looked at how PFAS is moving into the food chain, specifically into fish um, and alligators because they have a lot of fat and they're known to um, concentrate PFAS. So they're concentrating that at concentrations that are easier to measure. Um, and so we did actually collect, we did actually share all of our fish with that group to measure PFAS compounds. And we have not received that data yet. So, um, and to kind of follow up on that, the, I do believe the legislature has renewed um, some funding to continue this work. So um, they are taking this um, contamination problem very seriously, um, largely because what is going on in the lower Cape Fear and um, the problem is difficult because the PFAS chemicals keep changing. So it's a problem of we don't know what we're really looking for anymore. And so it like, becomes a lot harder to find. Thanks, Abby. I'd like to jump in on that as well. Um, so as she mentioned, the NC State study, I just popped it in the chat. That's uh, Scott Belcher working also with that Canape and other researchers. Um, they found high levels of specifically PFOS, P-F-O-S, a uh, legacy chemical, Napion byproduct two, which is a current Chemors chemical, um, and Gen X, and, and they're continuing that work. They're continuing grant requests. And like Abby said, the collaboratory was again funded for additional studies. Uh, last week, um, a study was released from Scott Belcher's lab on the alligator work that they've been doing for the last few years, finding autoimmune responses in the alligators. So there is PFAS work happening. Um, obviously, there's a lot of PFAS work happening, um, uh, but NC State has really been leading um, the charge on those um, those bass and alligator studies, and you can find the, the, um, that link in the uh, in the chat there. And once we have the data for PFAS in our, that's it's the same fish samples we have, um, we are going to update and see how that looks at the combination, but we just don't have it yet. And Ed, go back to your initial um, question. The reason that um, the studies were done by toxic sites was because we were trying to get those, those toxic sites identified. Remember the origins of these, this particular study had to do with people fishing near those toxic sites like potential cement factories, Sutton Lake and the coal ash ponds, the Kermagee site, et cetera. So um, those sites we saw when we would bring regulators out to those sites, there would be people fishing by the sites. So we knew people were not just eating fish out of the Cape Fear River, but they were eating them by these toxic sites. And that's what we needed to focus on. Uh, may I just tell you that the reason for the walk was not really to talk to the fishermen. The reason for the walk was to emphasize that people are being moved into um, that area um, now more um, and uh, flooding I conceive is a problem there and I can't understand why people are being moved in close to uh, two dumps that we know about um, they're in the city and uh, anybody want to toss in a, a guesstimate of what's going on and do anything about it give me a call All right, yeah, Data shared a couple of links in our chat. Um, so you guys can check out those, those links about PFAS specifically. Um, we have a couple more minutes if anybody has any last questions for our speakers. 
I just want to say um, that the um, folks from Duke, the Community Engagement Corps, are at the North Carolina Rice Festival in Leland today. They have a table set up. So if you want more information uh, and, and get one of those fancy schmancy calendars with the great recipes from Dean and um, Keith Rhodes, they will be at the Leland Cultural Arts Center today till about uh, 4.30 to 5. So you can come on out and visit uh, Dr. Liz Shapiro and Sam are out there and I will be joining them as soon as I get off this uh, Zoom. Thanks for that, Veronica. Should have mentioned that myself. Yeah, go check it out. <laughs> All right, and, oh, uh, I, I won't. I won't tell them that you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys all for coming out this morning. We'll have a recording of this up on our YouTube page and on our Facebook as well. Um, if you want to share or rewatch. Um, otherwise, I hope you all have really fantastic weekends and enjoy the nice weather if you're here in North Carolina. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye, everybody.